Hello and welcome to the What The Fork podcast in association with Viper Goalkeeping. Today we've got a special episode. We'll be getting the full lowdown on Sunderland's new head coach, Lee Johnson. And to give us that lowdown is Gregor McGregor, who's covered Johnson's almost full time at Bristol City. But first of all, before we go into it, how are you, Gregor? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all good. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having me, Graham. Not a problem. Thanks for doing it. It's always appreciated. Um, I think we'll kick straight off with a, a nice, easy one. What were your thoughts on Sunderland's appointment of Lee Johnson? I was actually a little bit surprised when I first heard about it because um, I've spoken to Lee myself a couple of times um, about a month ago, the last time, and I knew he was after the right job and he obviously wanted to come back into management. But he, he had said to me that he was willing to wait around for the right job to come up. And I always thought he particularly wanted some, somewhere where he wouldn't be too far from where he's based. He lives in a little an area of Bristol called Clifton, and he's got um, a daughter that he absolutely adores, who's just started secondary school at a very nice school in Clifton. So I, I actually thought he might want to hang around for the right job, and that one might be fairly sort of local to a degree. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, so when I first heard about the Sunderland interest on both sides and everything, I was a little bit surprised, and I thought, okay, maybe he's going to have a look at that. But I'm not too sure if he'll take it. And then when I heard that he got it and everything, and then, um, then well, yeah, it's obviously proven to be that maybe the lure of Sunderland is too big for him. Yeah, potentially, because I heard um, he's, he's alluded to a, a second job that he'd been speaking to um, quite at length in a couple of his interviews. And I've heard off the record um, it, it was Derby. So he obviously, if it was someone like Derby, he's obviously very much believed in the project to, to drop a division down and come to Sunderland. So... Um, you would say from sort of what you know, you think maybe the project's just been too big for him to turn down? Well, I know I know from people I've spoken to that the big thing with this job is that he, he's not got a promotion on his CV ever. And when he was down at Bristol, he was compared to Steve Cottrell a lot, his predecessor. And everybody always loved Cottrell for the promotion and double winning year that he had at City or Lee Johnson came. So my, my understanding is that the chance to basically become a, a hero up that way, take Sunderland back up to where they belong, that, um, or at least just get promotion to the championship, then, then yeah, that, that's, that really appeals to him and, and was a big lure. Just on the other clubs, I know, he, um, well, I was told he really was interested in the Sheffield Wednesday job. Obviously, Tony Pulis was appointed very quickly there. Uh, so, yeah, when I asked him a couple of weeks ago, I actually asked him for an interview to talk about Bristol stuff and he didn't want to do that which is fair fair enough um, and he said to me he was happy biding his time and was w- waiting to refine he was refining the process was the phrase he used and I'm sure we'll come on to some stuff like that yeah absolutely um, I suppose obviously you've had dealings with him and there's almost everyone in Sunderland hasn't at all in any way shape size or form and um, how did you find him you know man to man what, what kind of person is he he was very good with me. Uh, um, I spoke to him a couple of times about difficult stuff off the record. When you're a club reporter, a local one, it's, it's always a, a high wire act because you've got to re- report on the club fairly. But at times you can't win because you've also got a relationship with the club to respect. You've got to take the fan side and ultimately you work for the fans. So at times you've got to be harsh on Lee Johnson. And I was probably the most harsh of any of the reporters. And I had a couple of press conferences where he actually refused to answer my questions and he gave me the cold shoulder treatment. He didn't do that with, with any other um, reporters. I think he probably felt that I was being a little bit unfair with my questioning. So I would describe it as a, a bit of an up and down relationship at times. But he was always very fair with me. He was always very generous with his time. And you guys will find this as well. That he will be on podcasts and things uh, and, and he will, will spend time talking to the fans. He lives and breathes football. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to this, but I do think he is a very good fit for Sunderland. And I, and I do think he's a good appointment from the Black Cats as well. Um, but he is, as I say, uh, very um, outgoing. Um, and yeah, he, w- he was very fair with me. And I had to message him sometimes about some very delicate stories, sometimes regarding um, some stuff that I'd heard from essentially the changing room, and I wanted to get his side of stuff because otherwise you only hear from one 
side and he was very good about giving me his side and he was basically saying listen this is my side of the story you write what you want um, and I, he was very fair in that way so um, yeah generally generally I've got mostly good stuff to say about it as well he's, he does seem quite I don't know if there's such a thing as a modern manager I don't know if that's the right way to say it but he's I noticed he's on Twitter not not a great deal since he's he's left Bristol but I've noticed that he is on Twitter, which not many managers are. And I managed to come across a video the other day of him sort of speaking with the players. I think it was from like 2018 or something like that. And he, he seems like a kind of talkative, approachable guy that speaks very, very calmly. He doesn't seem the kind of man that gets irate. He seems to kind of want to get to know each of his players individually from what I've seen in that video. But a video doesn't tell the whole story. Is he that kind of man? Yeah, I, th- I think there is something to that. There was a, a podcast, I don't know if you know the one called Under the Cosh. You know absolutely, that one? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's Luke Steele was on there the other week and um, some of the Bristol City fans have picked up on that one uh, because Luke Steele was explaining what it was like working with Lee Johnson and he said he was one of the best talkers in the dressing room that he's had in his career, which I have to say is, is I have heard um, different opinions on that. Um, I've heard from one of the one of the guys down um, at Bristol City one time that they couldn't really take him too seriously. Um, I think that maybe was because of the relationship they had with Lee Johnson. Um, uh, but for, for Luke Steele to say that, I think I think is a big endorsement. They also had Aaron Wilbraham on that yeah. podcast about a year or so ago. That one's really worth checking out as well. And they both were very complimentary. It didn't say any bad stuff about Lee Johnson as well. And um, We'll come on to this, I'm sure. Well, this is a big thing that Johnson really does divide Bristol City fans. You'll have seen it on the comments on Twitter. A lot of them have probably been saying, oh, he's, he's rubbish or whatever. I don't think a lot of them appreciated the job that he did at Bristol City. And I think he did actually do a very good job consolidating the club. He took them away from the relegation zone. He got them fighting out, fighting at the right end of the table. They weren't too far away from making the top six a couple of times. And this is probably the biggest thing. I ought, I really do felt feel he was essentially had to manage a little bit with one hand tied behind his back because we have um, a CEO down this way, Mark Ashton, who essentially was in charge of recruitment. And I don't think the recruitment was very good. Um, as long as you, I saw you guys have appointed um, Christian um, Spielman, Speakman. what his name yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, from That's Birmingham, it. yeah. If he does a good job, then then obviously it'll help, help everybody. But I don't think Lee Johnson had the, the, the best players come in and, and he had to make do at times. Um, and it, this is an e- example of him. He's very, very loyal, and very, very club orientated. What I might mean by that is I gave him so many times to sort of say that he, he'd been, uh, uh, he didn't have the playing staff that he wanted or he didn't have the players that he wanted. But he never did that. He, 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 never, he never went down that road at all. And ultimately, he always said that he did have the final say on recruitment. They just couldn't recruit real quality. It was often cheaper buys from abroad or players on free transfers and maybe being a little bit creative in the transfer market. And I suspect that's what you guys might see, um, especially at first, if you haven't got a lot of money to spend um, over the next few transfer windows. Yeah, and of course, we're, we're kind of restricted, I suppose, with the, the wages situation in the division as well, which may restrict them as well. Um, I did notice that with Bristol City fans. I mean, there's been either, yeah, he's great, he's, he's fine, he'll do a good job, it's a great appointment. It's been contrasted with, oh my God, he's terrible, I hate him, this reason, that reason, the other reason. Um, but someone kind of said something in the middle and said the, the problem Lee Johnson had was he was always battling against his reputation as a player for Bristol City and he wasn't massively well liked as a player. Is there an element of truth to that? Absolutely, 100%. And um, yeah, a lot of fans have said to me that he just wasn't accepted as a player. And I was speaking to somebody recently and I'm not um, from the Southwest myself, but somebody has said to me that people in the Southwest, and I do get this sometimes, from uh, Bristol City fans, but it might apply to all football fans. They, they love to moan, and they love to moan about Lee Johnson as a player. And because his dad, Gary Johnson, was in charge, they just thought it was just too uh, nepotistic that he was involved, and they just couldn't accept him as a player. A lot of them. Others saw him as, as what he was, in, um, uh, a diminutive central midfielder, but with a good range of passing, etc. And he, he had some skills. Um, 
fit. He maybe wasn't the, the first name on the team sheet or shouldn't have been at times. Um, but he did play a big role in the club and he was part of the, the side that got to the 2008 um, playoff final, very, very close to being promoted to the Premier League, obviously losing to Hull 1-0. Um, but yeah, you're spot on. That, that, that's it. A lot of them right from the get-go. But the other thing is actually to, to tie in, you have to understand the context of when he came in. Um, he replaced Steve Cottrell and Cottrell was loved by the fans because he, he romped League One with Bristol City, Cottrell did. He won. He did the double and he did it playing a brilliant brand of football. They got almost 100 points and they scored so many goals. They smashed so many teams. Uh, so Cottrell was loved. And then he, Cottrell left without being able to do the recruitment that he wanted, without being able to spend on the likes of Andre Gray, other players he wanted. He had basically had lined up actually to come in. And because of that, the fans then turned against uh, the, the Lansdowns, the owners of the club, who, who didn't want to put that money up front. They didn't want to invest that quickly. They wanted to do it in a different way. So then when they brought Lee Johnson in, the accusation was that Johnson was a yes man. He was going to be, he was just basically the, the, the owner's pet, if you like. So it's that background that meant a lot of the fans didn't like him from the get-go, which is, which is always held him back in it to a degree. And he actually said to me one time, um, off, the, off the record, but I don't think he would mind me saying this, that would, would Alex Neal get the same scrutiny that he did if Neal was in charge of Bristol City? So that kind of hints that he, he, he gets that and he does understand that. This, this is another thing about him. He will read all of the feedback and everything that he gets. He will speak to people. He's, he's, um, he's very thick-skinned, but he will take notice of, of, of things people say and write about. Yeah, interesting. Um, one of the, the big, big things that Sunderland fans will listen to and, and want to know, and I've also noticed a contrast with this as well, is we've dealt with Parkinson for a year and his brand of football is no frills and it didn't really do... It did what it said in the tin without actually doing anything in terms of boosting Sunderland up the league, so it wasn't a good brand of football to watch and the results weren't. Uh, Lee Johnson's come in and a lot of people have said, oh, you know, he's... His style of football is really good. It's high press. It's it's uh, the correct way to play football, which I'll say in inverted commas, um, which I don't know if is a correct statement, but nonetheless, but it's a good style, shall we say, a nice style to watch. Um, I've read a few Bristol City fans who commented and said, you know, that's not always true. He, he sort of changed style throughout the years and he started off really well and he got compliments off like Pep Guardiola and stuff like that. And then he changed, went defensive and put 10 men behind the ball. But I suppose, from a neutral perspective, what is Johnson's style of football and what can Sunderland fans expect to see? I think at its best, and when when he was able to, it was, as he describes it, front foot football, high energy, high press. He, he probably, his maybe favoured formation was maybe something like a 4-2-3-1, which he, he got his best results with. Um, he... he, he he attacked a lot of teams and I always remember covering the club and going to places like Wolves and the high-flying teams over the last couple of years who've gone up to the Premier League, Sheffield United. And it was always a shootout. You got you guys, if you get some of that, you'll, you'll see it, that games were 3-2, unfortunately often lo losses, but at least they really took the game to, to, the, to the bigger teams and they went for it. So, yeah, ideally at its best, then, um, and when he could, then it was like that. But Lee Johnson was also very pragmatic and it would depend on the personnel that he had. And this is the backdrop to his managing and what a lot of fans down this way don't take into account when they criticise him for his results and for his football. And I have to say that there, there is something um, from what those fans are saying that at times it was very sterile at home. Um, there wasn't a lot of excitement in the home form. He wasn't able to get things going in the in the second season. And yeah, their home form over the last two years under Lee Johnson wasn't particularly impressive. And that's probably what held them back from making the top six. And they just didn't create enough chances. But it was mainly because they lost their best players. They constantly sold their best players. And they, they had this philosophy where if a big club, club came in, they would sell the players for the right price. They wouldn't hold anybody back. But then they would reinvest that money. And... Most of the time it worked, but at other times you had to be a bit patient and um, give, give uh, Johnson a bit of time to bed the new guys in, get the new system working, get everybody used to the way they had to be playing. And just like, likewise, the, the end of the last season, 
They did exactly that. They sold his captain, Josh Brownhill, who I know he, he didn't want to sell. Um, he wanted to keep him till the summer, but they decided to cash in, cash in on him. They had a big bid from Burnley. They reinvested the money in Narky Wells because they wanted a, a, a 20-goal striker to come in. They got Wells, but Wells hasn't really replicated the form he showed at QPR just yet. And it's taken him a bit of time to gel with his teammates. So, yeah, uh, at his best. And when, when it was rocking, Ashton Gate was on fire. And when we had the 2017-18 Carabao Cup run, where he beat four Premier League teams. And that was consistent that when he played his first first um, longest team in the Cups, that he did beat the bigger teams. He had a great record of that. Then, then yeah, the football was great. It just wasn't consistent. But I think that probably says a little bit more about his squad than Lee Johnson. Yeah. One of the, the big results that stick out for me, obviously being a Sunderland fan, is uh, as we ended up calling it Bristol Ball when we pulled it back from uh, three goals down. And I remember him saying after that that he kind of held his hands up and said it was his fault because he wanted to win the game sort of seven or eight nil. Um, you said before, you know, uh, manage, I think managers in general, they, they do sort of learn and they do kind of not make the same mistake twice. But do you think Lee Johnson's the kind of manager that would try and win the game seven or eight nil again? Or do you think that kind of result that he had against us maybe makes him a bit more, maybe I'll just go for the four. Good question. I Does he, does he learn? I, I don't know. I, I'm not too sure he would do. I think he would go for it each time and, and probably ties in more to his philosophy. He, he was always big on explaining his, his managerial take on, uh, on his team having a certain identity. And towards the end of his reign at Bristol City, that identity became diluted. And a lot of fans would say, what identity? And um, there are several different reasons for that. I, I, I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he is a bit more pragmatic while he is up that way. Um, and it will depend on his playing resources and things like that. We, we, we didn't really see him, I don't think learn from certain results and play for a different way. That's probably one criticism of him, that he had certain things that he stuck with, certain personnel that he stuck with through thick and thin, um, thin and, and maybe needed to be a little bit more flexible. I know that that was one thing that grated with a lot of fans, that maybe he wasn't honest enough at, at times in interviews or accepting of enough um, mistakes from the team. One, one big problem that a lot of fans allude to this way is that he would, in their words, throw players under the bus in interviews. And I thought it was very interesting, actually. I watched his first interview after your, the loss against Wigan that weekend. And I think that shows why, at the very start of the interview, he set out who he was talking to. He said, All right, this interview is going to be read by three different, uh, listened or watched by three different people. Yeah. The players, the owners. And I think that is because a lot of fans said, listen, you're always throwing the, the, the players under the bus. It's not, it can't be good for morale. And that, in a way, though, is explained by Lee Johnson just being a bit too honest at times. And I do think he is an emotional kind of guy. That can go both ways. You, you'll see passion on the sidelines. One example of that was um, Blackburn came and won at Ashton Gate this time last year. And I saw Johnson at the end of the game square up to one of the uh, Blackburn coaches and he actually grabbed him by the throat uh, on, as they go into the tunnel. You don't see that even so much, I don't think, these days. But even though like, I had a lot of fans saying, oh, he can't be doing that, I actually thought that showed the edge that he's got and the passion that he's got and how much he wants to win. And I personally like that kind of fire from him. Um, and I do think you will see that. He is an emotional guy. If you catch him, and I've been a victim of this, if you catch him at the wrong time, ask him the wrong stuff, then you, you'll get it back, thrown back at you. Um, so it cuts both ways. And I, I do think he has to, and he's a, he sort of said this himself, I was going to say to you guys, check out his LinkedIn page if you haven't done yet, because that's a tremendous resource. Um, there was, I think I saw, well, there's, there was an anecdote on there about Bailey Wright and him introducing Bailey Wright yeah, right to uh, Ian Wright. Yeah. yeah, you guys might have seen it. I think it was in the press today that way. Um, and yeah, we ran that a, a, a while ago, but there's some good stuff on there. And he does... Um, put some posts on there that, that say, says to me that he, he, he recognises his weaknesses and he's, he's learned from them and hopefully he'll be a better manager for it. 
With them, um, talked before but about Bailey White there, you, you brought on perfectly with that. And funnily enough, Bailey White had an absolute stink yesterday and probably the first bad game he's ever had for, for Sunderland since he's got here. But um, he talked about transfers. And I think that's what we quite liked is that he'd identified already what it was that Sunderland had been missing. We missed pace and we missed power. And he spoke about it in his first his first interview. It was like music to our ears. But <sighs> actions and words, I suppose. And, and hopefully he's backed. But when it comes to January, he's, he's going to be wanting to sign people. That's going to have to happen either way. If there is a, a player that you would say is a Lee Johnson kind of player, and I knew he was, I know you said before, he's a little bit hamstrung a little bit, but what sort of player would you describe as a Lee Johnson player? What kind of players does he like? I actually thought Lee Johnson from his main purchases were very good. It's just, you got the impression down this way that he, he had to cut his corners at uh, cut corners at times. They just didn't want to spend the money um, this way. He, I I need to explain that the background to his transfer market work this way, which makes it a little bit difficult to judge, is that the owners here want to make the club sustainable, and they put in um, a, a, something like three, four, five million pounds every year, but not necessarily for transfers. And so they have to sell players to then buy. Yeah. So because of that, he was always selling um, the best players. But he always developed them so well. And one uh, one example that sticks out for me is they sold he sold Aidan Flint, um, who was a massive hero down this way, was doing very, very well, was wanted by Mills, but signed for Tony, I think it was Tony Pulis, uh, for, uh, for big, big money. And they immediately reinvested it in Adam Webster, which was an absolutely genius move. We only had him for one... Year sold him for more than twenty million pounds to Brighton. He's doing very, very well at Brighton, and that was a, a move that was definitely uh, identified by Lee Johnson. And he explained to us so many times that he was only ever going to part with Aidan Flint if he could bring in Adam Webster as the replacement. They 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 worked that move really smartly, and and likewise the the they did other trading um, such as the Brownhill Wells one that. I mentioned earlier, and it was always sort of one big player out, one big player in. Um, where it didn't go well was um, sort of European players, players without much experience of the league. Uh, but yeah, if there's one archetypal player, um, it's definitely a, a player in his own image. He loves a technical player and he loves maybe diminutive midfielders a little bit too much. We've got... Um, uh, a young Frenchman, uh, Han Noah Masengo, who, incidentally, I wouldn't be surprised if he came up to you guys on loan or something this, this year, because there's been a few transfers I've noticed recently between Bristol City and Sunderland. So there is a bit of a relationship there. Obviously, Bailey Wright coming over and Antoine Semenyo. Semenyo. You guys. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if Masengo's not playing at all down our way and he might fit what you guys um, are looking for. He needs to play and he was um, a big favourite of Lee Johnson. Um, but him, uh, Liam Walsh, we've got another diminutive central midfielder. Um, Lee Johnson was asked a couple of years ago if he could sign any player in the championship, who would he ideally most like to bring in? His answer was Barry Bannon, um, who he absolutely adores. Uh, yeah, a bit of a strange answer, because um, you think about any top striker at the time. Um, other players, I know that he was very, very keen on um, just... just the ones that never made it to fruition, but there was an interest start where um Britta Somba Longa um at Borough. Um it was quite he was after a, a striker for a long time. Um other players um trying to think of ones who maybe got away. Can't think of can't think of anyone too just off the top of my head at the moment. But yeah, definitely diminutive technical central midfielders. Bristol City fans probably said he had too many of those. Um, for their liking. One of the one thing I liked about his interview yesterday, and again, it, embarrassing defeat, but it's not really it's not anything to do with him at, at this moment in time. Um, but he did speak about academies and and bringing young players through, and and it's easy as a manager to say that. I think almost every manager does it, but I quite like the fact that he stayed away from the usual sort of platitudes. Um, he did sort of speak. It's seemingly more honestly, I don't know why it seemed more honest than maybe what other managers normally would be, but it seemed to be. Now, Sunderland have 
got a great academy. It's not been well looked after, in my opinion, um, at all recently, but it doesn't mean that there's not a, a good few players coming through, like this Dan Neal, Jack Diamond came on yesterday. And, the, and there's some players that under Phil Parkinson just didn't get an opportunity, if I'm honest with you, not as much as we thought. And Johnson's came in and spoke an awful lot about youth. And I think there's a few Bristol City fans have said to myself and other fans, he's quite good at dealing with youth and, and sort of moulding younger players and introducing them into the side. For younger players like, you know, Jack Diamond, Dan Neal, the players we have, you know, how good is he at improving young players and bringing them through into the first team in the in the right sort of manner? I would say it's probably his strongest um, skill set for me is his work on the training pitch and developing players. He's brilliant um, at that. And one, one thing we did was we um, spoke to some former players who had transferred from Bristol City to Cardiff. And we asked them um, what they made of the difference or what they made of Neil Warnock compared to Lee Johnson. And, and one of them said that basically they're chalk and cheese, Johnson and Warnock. Lee Johnson is brilliant on the training pitch. He is up there um, the best. And Neil Warnock very, does very little on the, the training pitch. He'll have um, his, his other coaches doing that. But when it came to man management, it was unfortunately the other way round. And I think this is one area where Lee Johnson's got a bit of room to, to work on is, is his man management. And that actually um, comes into play with young players as well, because, um, and it's a little bit difficult to know exactly how much, but a big thing at Bristol City was they wanted him to play young players and bring through young talents. And he, and he had a spectacularly good record at this early on. Um, and he brought through Lloyd Kelly was one main success. And Lloyd, they did they did brilliantly because they sold Joe Bryan and they brought through Lloyd Kelly and and, and Lee Johnson did fantastic with him. And and Kelly is is, is such a talent. He got a massive B uh, when he went to Bournemouth. And I know Lloyd um, speaks very highly of Lee Johnson. Um, but then the other side of it actually was Antoine Semenyo, who was kind of pushed on Lee Johnson a little bit. Um, and I think Lee Johnson actually wanted to go for a more senior player. Semenyo came in and that, that kind of didn't really work um, for various reasons. I think Lee Johnson preferred a senior player to come in. And I, I, I've heard stories from the dressing room about Lee. And in fact, Lee has said this himself, that he can be a little bit old fashioned at times in terms of how he deals with young players because he wants to toughen them up and get them really ready for, for playing first team senior football. At times, it can seem like he's he has a, more of a penchant for senior players and he will stick with the, the older, more tested guys. But if a young player is good enough, he will play them without doubt. Um, towards the end of his reign at Bristol City, he didn't play many um, younger players. And that was one reason why both actually, I've heard that the club sort of thought that that was one reason why Lee Johnson needed to move on. Also, it was a big... Uh, hang up with the fans. They they saw that he wasn't playing many of the youth guys. They'd moved away from that. And the senior guys weren't doing any better than anyone else. So why shouldn't he at least give the young guys a chance? So I think if your youth players are good enough, he will play them without doubt. But he won't just chuck them in there if they're not. So I wouldn't expect to see loads of youth involvement. But if you do see it, then it's because, because they are good enough. And he has got a very good eye for a player. I will, I'll say that. I, Honestly, do think um, he, he he knows he's a very good judge of what it what it takes to to make it in in League One and, and the Championship. I don't know how much of the, the history behind it you know, and I know outside of Sunderland, which is a bit of a goldfish bowl at times. Um, not many people will, but the Aidan McGeady situation was probably the the biggest take from the, the whole situation that he kind of took charge a few hours beforehand and we'd been told that McGeady was going to be in the squad obviously he'd been ousted for the best part of a year under Parkinson I don't think he was even training with teams at points um, and Johnson said yesterday that he was originally meant to be on the bench and he actually boosted him to the first team because he wanted a clean slate and um, what do you think his thinking will have been behind that with McGeady because McGeady is obviously a, a huge personality that hasn't played for a year I, yeah, I saw that actually, and I read the stories and everything before, and then obviously he was picked up on it after the game. And I think it's just as he said, to be honest, just a blank canvas for absolutely everybody. 
and Lee Johnson is open-minded. I'll I'll give him that. He, I, I think he would would will really have wanted just to have a look at every single player and give everybody a fair chance. And I have to say, from his time at Bristol City, he was always very good at handling the veteran, senior, and star players. Aidan Flint was one. Lee Tomlin, who obviously was a, over at Middlesbrough for a bit. Yeah. Was he was he came in was a bit of a star player um, at Bristol City. He did a fantastic job helping um, Bristol City stay up. Actually, the very first season when Lee Johnson took charge, but after they made his um, per, um, loan deal permanent and he got on this nice big fat contract, his uh, performances tailed off. And he actually had a few personal problems. This is Tomlin. Um, he he was still living actually in Leicester. And he was commuting from Bristol. So his fitness went completely um, and they sold him eventually to Cardiff. But throughout all that time, none of this came out at all in the press or anything. Um, and there were no complaints at all. And there's never been any complaints from Lee Tomlin about his treatment from Lee Johnson. Lee Johnson did eventually explain all this stuff later on that, uh, further down the line. He was very, very clever in his management actually on that. And so I do think that, yeah, he, he's very good at handling the senior players. And just because of that, McGeady, he would have come in and he would have identified him as a guy who, if you can get him, I saw him saying, if you can get him firing on, on, on top form, although it might have been a while since you guys have seen that, I don't know, um, then he would be a huge asset. And I, I just think he's open-minded like that. I think that's a, a big thing about him. And he just will have had a look. If he doesn't do it, then McGeady will lose his place and, and somebody else will get a chance. With um, Bailey Wright being there already, like how much of a, I don't want to say ally because it sounds like it's like him and Bailey versus the rest of the team, but um, having an ally and someone that you know, you mentioned Jesse that he'd, he'd managed Josh Gowan when he was at Barnsley, but I don't know for how long. Um, but obviously, Bailey Wright but didn't just play under him, he was his captain. And you are touching it before that I think it was something about the his ability to, I think it was the power of introduction, I think he was talking about, which is quite good. And he really talked Bailey up at that point. How beneficial is it going to be to Lee Johnson to, to sort of have Bailey right there? Because although he's talking up really highly, to a Sunderland fan, you think, well, he's just sold them. So has anything happened there? Or are they quite close as a, as a parent? Very close. I, I honestly think that would have been massive in him taking the job because he knows that straight away he's got a guy that he promoted to his club captain while he was at Bristol City. So is, is he the captain at Sunderland? He's it's actually Max Power, but he's Max Power's been in and out of the team. So I I would say on the pitch, yeah, yeah, I would say Bailey's Bailey's probably the captain. He's he's vice captain officially. Right. Uh yeah. No, I completely agree with you there, Graham. And I think that will have been a huge, huge draw for this job, knowing that he's straight away got a senior person on his side. Um he Bailey Wright had a he was a little bit unfortunate with injuries when he was at Bristol City, not necessarily always being injured, but just in the timing of them. He would quite often well, he'd play a lot of games, but then he would come up to the important part of the season. He might get an injury. Um, but uh, just before, I think it was the 2018 World Cup, actually, um, Wright played almost every game at right back, went through a really great run, probably his best form at Bristol City. And he unfortunately got injured just before the World Cup, partly because he was playing through the pain barrier for Bristol City. And, and he did that, I, I'm, I'm sure, because of um, yeah, because how professional he is, and Lee Johnson would have remembered that. He's very, very loyal, Lee Johnson. Um, and yeah, you're spot on that. That um, what, what's the what's the phrase? That relationship between the two of them will be huge, and will be a real foundation for Sunderland moving forward, without doubt. Yeah, and I think oh, like I said, he had a bad game yesterday. I think in the twenty odd games he's played, he's, it's his first bad game. So I think I think we're all all right with it. We just hope it's not a regular occurrence. Ultimately, though, I mean, to, to me, from the outside looking in, Lee Johnson always seemed that he was doing a relatively good job at Bristol City, but it's very different when you're a fan. And then he got sacked or he left. Um, when did it go sour and why did it go sour towards the end? Basically, the club wanted him to be in the top six and they're very, very ambitious. Um, at Bristol City, the owners have created this umbrella group for Bristol Sport. It's very American um, sort of setup, and they also own the Bristol Bears, who who have won, just recently won a European trophy and are going strength to strength. And they want to see that same success now with the football club. 
the only thing is they're not willing to bankroll that. So, yeah. so I actually think Bristol City, the Bristol City job is one of the um, hardest jobs because, yes, you are having um, sort of two to three, four million pounds pumped in every year, um, but it's not enough to bring in star players, star quality at all. And uh, you, we've got um, a pretty good academy with a fairly decent conveyor belt of talent, um, which Lee Johnson had to um, develop. He did a very good job at but the club ultimately wanted him to finish in the top six and the results weren't on par with that. And I just think that everybody kind of felt that he'd had his chance um, and there were a few little areas where he was coming short. He'd stopped sort of playing some of the younger players. The football at home at Ashton Gate over the last year had really deteriorated. Um, and I think he'd probably taken the squad at the time as far as it could go. But what... I sort of said to you at the beginning of this was that I don't think Bristol City fans appreciated the job he did from consolidating the club from fighting relegation to being up at the fighting, fighting at the right end of the table at the same time as always selling your best players. I was very surprised personally when he lost his job. I thought he would be given longer. And I actually think he d deserves to be given longer as well. Because if, if you take away your three best players every summer, and that's almost what happened, you lose your three best players, okay replace them but um at a big profit it was always by it was always buying a player who was probably on the up rather than guaranteed quality and then be expected to get instant results was harsh so i actually think he was a little bit harshly done by and yeah i was surprised when he went the only thing i would say is that the fans well four years is a fairly long time and, and a lot of fans will say he had his chance and it wasn't really going anywhere would you say, in its early days, because we're only at December, so it's difficult to judge, I suppose, Dean Hold, not necessarily um, this early, I suppose, anyway, but do you think Bristol City have been any better off for, for not having Lee Johnson? Because it looks like, based on league position, they're in pretty much where they were previously. Yeah, ask me at the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Well, I... I Personally, I think there's a little bit better spirit in the camp at the moment than towards the end of Lee Johnson's days. And I do think Lee Johnson was a little bit responsible for that. I think he fell out with a few of the players around the fringes, not his first team players, just guys who weren't um, playing very much. They couldn't really understand why. Um, a big criticism from the fans was uh, they called it Lee Johnson bingo. Uh, which was his team selection before matches, where they just could never understand which 11 were going to be playing. And it often didn't seem like there was a lot of logic behind his 11. He certainly didn't have a core of players that he stuck with. He probably tinkered a little bit too much at times. That's one thing that, that maybe he will have learned from. It'll be interesting to see if he sticks with a, a more settled side up that way. He's, he, he, the other thing I should mention was that he got this term of being called Streaky Johnson. I'm sure you will have come across it. Across it. He had across good it. runs and then bad runs. He could never shake the bad runs. And I kind of think that that was a little bit to do with the spirit in the camp, that it just wasn't quite up there where it should have been. And if it had have been, it might have been able to turn things around a little bit quicker. But again, it's, it's, it's easy me saying this when he's having um, his best players sold. And I think he may be, ultimately, he might have had some players in there he didn't really want in there. I think this is part of it. But this is a little bit to do with the politics of the club and him having um, a guy there who, who was bringing in players who maybe weren't his first choice all the time. Um, and he was ever so good in that he never, ever threw the club under the bus. He never he never took that route out of it. And I guess you could argue, you could argue well, he was never going to because he lost his job if he'd done that. But there were ways and means of, of him being able to do that but he never did take them. So, yeah, uh, basically, I do think they are slightly improved, but not a huge amount improved. So final question, I guess, and it's kind of looking into your crystal ball here, so whether you can answer it, I don't know, but we were linked to Gus Poyet was apparently the manager on Monday, then it was Cowley, then it was Paul Cook, and it ended up being Lee Johnson. I think his interviews, you know, have done really well, but at the same time, we've just lost to the... The bottom, of the bottom of the table crisis club. So 
I think no one points out Johnson, obviously, but everyone was quite impressed by him, but he probably was the majority of people not their first choice. Do you think come the end of the season or come the end of his tenure that Sunderland fans are likely to think, actually, that was a good run. He did a good job. I think there's a good chance that, that, that they will say that, yeah. Because I think Lee Johnson's actually had fairly good success everywhere he's been. I think if he can replicate that at the Stadium of Light, you, I think you'll go very close to promotion, although you guys will say that that's the same story every year. Can he make the difference? <laughs> Not too sure. Maybe. I, I could see it going well. Um, probably I'll, I'll throw in that on Saturday, Bristol City played um, I forgot who played, at home to Birmingham. But it was obviously one of the huge talking points was that Lee Johnson had just been appointed at, at Sunderland. And all the reporters there said that's a good job for him and it's a good move for him and it's a good move by Sunderland. And I do think there is something about Lee Johnson as a manager. I think if he can just improve that little bit and, and he is he, he works so hard, he works as hard as anyone. I know this from speaking to so many different people around the club, around football. You, you will not find anyone who works harder than Lee Johnson. Um, he's obsessive and that is both a weakness and a, and a success because he can just get a little bit too obsessed about certain things. Um, he'll work so hard if he can develop that little bit. I, I could see him finding success at, at Sunderland. Like, I could see that being a good marriage. He is very good at being creative around stuff. Um, one little, you probably would have come across this story, but Bobby Reed was a young guy, very impressive um, guy who'd come through the academy and he never had really done anything for the team. And Lee Johnson moved into to a slightly different position and suddenly it exploded into a £10 million pound player. Um, and now he's yeah playing in the Premier League, impressing with Fulham. He'll, he'll, if he's got that, that kind of player at Sunderland, he'll find them and he'll develop them and you, you, you'll get the same. And that was all Lee Johnson. And he's done that with other players. He, he's, if you look through the players he's worked with, there are so many successes. James Tarkovsky, um, was a player that he, he knew very well. Um, obviously, brought him from Brentford at Oldham, I think. Um, and yeah, uh, Alfie Mawson, another one from his Barnsley time, now doing a very good job um, at Bristol City, actually, at the moment. Um, and there are so many success stories. He, give him the time, you can't fail to have more of those stories. He, he will develop players. Um, whether it'll be enough to get you guys promoted, that's the million dollar question. I think he will come down to a little bit of luck, and I think maybe he is a little due a little bit of luck. And I think he also he is one of those managers who is a little bit lucky at the same time. So um, yeah, I'm going to put my neck on the chopping board and say um, I could see him maybe getting success there. Yeah, I've got one last point to make to you. Go on. You, you might I don't know if you've seen this, but he was asked a while ago, would he ever do Sunderland till I die? And he said. And he said he would never, ever do it because he doesn't want what he say, says in the changing room and the way he's portrayed in the dressing room to come out and be in the public domain. He's, he's a little bit private like that. So, um, yeah, I, that's my, that is my other prediction. That there won't be a Sunderland till I die with him in charge. Yeah, this Sunderland fan's very pleased to hear that. So <laughs> I'd rather there wasn't a season three either because it seems to only end in tragedy or a comedy, as some would put it. But like I say, Gregor, thanks so much for popping on. Really nice insight. And fingers crossed we've got a lot of success with them. Thanks for having me. Good luck for the season.